What's up guys, Coding Jesus here. Guys, in today's video, I'm going to be speaking about the past two years, what I've learned, and really targeting that junior quantitative developer or junior software engineer. I'm gonna be filming out there. I'm currently in a villa facing the ocean. And so before we jump into today, today's content, let me just switch locations. All right guys, so the uh, change in scenery is complete. As you can see, a lot of things here around the island are still under construction. Um, and so this, I guess you can say, is the entrance to the ocean. And that's the ocean. Now back to today's video. Okay, today's video is going to be about what I've learned over the last two years for that junior quantitative developer, that prospective quantitative developer or software engineer. Now, the last two years I've really been focusing on my own personal growth and development on my career and it's really paid itself off in terms of, I guess you can say, the fruits of my labor. I work on applications that are a lot more uh, impactful in terms of risk and direct impact on the firm's profit and loss. I've moved up the ranks, I'm now managing a team, and so a lot has changed. And throughout that change, I've also learned a lot about the world of quantitative development that I'd like to share with the viewers, I guess, watching this video. And so let's jump right into it. These are the couple of things that I think are important to pass down to that junior coding Jesus, that junior aspiring quantitative developer. The first thing is, in software engineering, when it comes to fixing a bug or somebody's looking for you to build a new feature, they're often going to give you like one, two, maybe three sentences if you're lucky as to what they would like to change, what they would like you to do. I think the naive quantitative developer and naive software engineer is just going to jump right into it, look at the code, try to figure out things immediately. Don't do that. The best thing to do is to take a step back and make sure you understand what they're looking to, for you to do. By that I mean synthesize what you think they want of you in a half a page to one page scope. Solidify the requirements and then pass that half a page to one page scope back to them and say, hey, is this what you'd like me to do? Is my understanding of this task correct? That'll help you tremendously in terms of saving time and making sure you're doing exactly what that person wants of you. The next thing or next piece of advice I would give you guys is don't be afraid to say no, but to do so politely. What do I mean by that? Well, I think a lot of people, especially at the junior level, are very excited and they're eager and that's great and they want to do a lot but you need to realize you only have eight hours a day and most likely your plate's going to be full the last thing you want to do is to say yes to everything such that you don't achieve anything let me give you a concrete example let's say you have a b and c on your plate projects a b and c now somebody comes up to you maybe a trader or a researcher and says hey man i want to work on d can you work on that with me? The naive person would say yes. I think somebody with a little more tact would say, can you run that by my manager, please? What that's, what's gonna happen is your manager, which is supposed to guard your work. There's a helicopter here, give me a second. Your manager, which is supposed to guard your work in terms of timelines and priorities, is either gonna say one of a couple of things. They're either gonna tell that person, well, Let's not do D because you can achieve 90% of what you want from D in E and E is already complete so go and play around with E or they're going to say yeah let's do D. Now your next question is not okay I'm going, should I start on it now? Your question is okay how important is D relative to what I'm currently working on which is A, B and C. So if you work on A, B and C there might also be a couple of answers there. Maybe D is the least important. If it's least important, you go back to that person and say, hey, listen, I'm currently working on A, B, and C. D is the least important. And because A, B, and C combined are gonna take you know, four weeks, I'm gonna wrap back, I'm gonna circle back to you in around four weeks and we'll get started on this project. In the meantime, please hammer out the scope, for example. Or your boss might say that D is the most important, for example, and you wanna work on it immediately. In that case, you need to communicate to your boss that the timeline for A, B, and C is going to change given that D has started. Now, of course, if you have a good boss, then he's going to know that, you know, that goes without saying. But regardless, communicating is going to be important. So you let that person know 
how priorities and timelines are going to change given the addition of a new project. Okay. Another thing that I want to talk about um, is communication style. Communication style is very important. As I mentioned, I'm a manager and I communicate with my employees at least once a day in the form of a stand-up. And I do weekly one-on-ones with my employees to make sure that they are being able or that, that they are able to communicate how they feel not only about the business or their work back to me, but also things outside of work that might be impacting, I guess you can say, the way they perform at work. But beyond just communicating, I guess, your feelings and how work is, what you really want to understand is a person's communication style. So when you have that first meeting with your boss, ask him, how do you prefer I communicate with you? What's your communication style? There's different communication styles. Every person has a different one. Let me give you an example. I'm somebody that's blunt and to the point. I'll give you a one sentence response if that's all that's needed to convey what I'd like you to do or what I think you should do. Now, other people prefer that you kind of massage your words in terms of, you know, instead of saying, yes, I'd like you to do this, you say, well, I've looked at option A and B and considered C and given C's time priority, I think that B should be the one that you spend half your day on and the next two hours on this. I'm not really that type of person and a lot of people in the world of quantitative trading are not. And so somebody out there, I guess the naive person that hasn't met a manager that is more blunt and to the point, might think that that person is being rude or dismissive when in fact that's a certain communication style. Uh, it has nothing to do with you know, being rude or malicious to that person because of you know, reason X, Y, or Z. That's just how they communicate. And so being acclimated to all sorts of different communication styles and understanding how different people at the organization communicate and setting those communication expectations is going to be very important for you as a junior developer. Okay. Another point that I want to bring up, and I have so many points, and that's why they're all on my phone here, so if you look at, see me kind of looking to the side, it's because I just can't remember all of this. Another point that's going to be important is for you to familiarize yourself with the business. What do I mean by that? Well, the first week that you guys onboard, you're going to be sitting at your desk and you know completing certain tasks. Before you do that, walk around and introduce yourself to everybody at the organization. After you do that, and after you've kind of gone through that initial ramp up period of maybe a couple of days up to a week or two, speak to your boss and say, hey, can I shadow a junior quantitative trader? Or can I shadow a quantitative researcher? That means you sit behind them and you watch what they do. So you look at where they're putting their attention, right? They might have eight to 16 monitors in front of them. What are they looking at? Which applications are they using the most? What are their pain points? What would they like to change when it comes to the technology at the, at the organization? Um, what sort of bugs exist that they are really looking for somebody to alleviate? Write all this stuff down. Not only will this give you a better understanding of how the business works, a more holistic take of the organization, but it'll also help you understand what impact your changes have on the people surrounding you which is gonna be very important in understanding the best way to go about certain changes and just give you a better sense of, I guess you can say, responsibility and um, an achievement when it comes to actually pushing something into production, okay? Another thing that's gonna be important as a junior quantitative developer or software engineer in the space is to understand that burnout is real, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people think that you know, I started, I broke into the space, you know, I'm a software engineer now, I'm a junior quantitative developer now. That means I need to put in like 13 hour days to make sure that everybody knows I'm serious. Okay, calm down. Everybody knows you're a superstar, but if you wanna make an impact long-term on the organization, the best thing to do is put in your eight hours, go home, be with your family, participate in hobbies, go to the gym, play video games, whatever you like to do. Because in the long run, if you're there 13 hour days, you know, putting in 14 hours a day, you're gonna get burnt out. And by burnt out, I mean, you're gonna be sitting in the office, scratching your head with eye bags under your eyes saying, I don't wanna be here. I need to get out of here. I wanna quit. And that's the last thing you wanna do in an industry that's so impactful, so fun to be around when you're surrounded by very bright and intelligent people who are genuinely looking out for your best interest and want you to succeed. 
Okay, so understand that burnout's real and take that time off. That's what I'm doing here, guys. I'm in the middle of the ocean on a rock, you know, jet skiing, playing with stingrays, um, going to, you know, look at starfish, golfing, enjoying the restaurants here. And so, yeah, burnout's real. Another thing that I think is going to be important for you guys, especially on the junior level, if you want to ramp up quickly, is to take advantage of your organization's educational budget. A lot of the learning is on the job, but a lot of the learning too is off the job. Off the job in terms of what are you doing to better yourself as a software engineer? Let me give you an example. So I work with a lot of structured and unstructured data, and I want it to be put on a project that involves a lot of unstructured data. When you think of unstructured data, you think of Cassandra DB, MongoDB, etc. And I didn't previously have experience to this a while back. And so what I did is I tapped into my organization's educational budget. I asked my boss for a book on unstructured data on a specific database that I was going to be interacting with on a project in the next coming month or two. And I read that entire book in a couple of weeks. Right? I took it easy. I did it outside of work. I did it on my weekends. But nonetheless, by the time that I got to that project that involved unstructured data, I was a total expert at it. I was able to complete it within its timeline and it did have a tight timeline. And I felt proud of the fact that I didn't need to feel stressed on the job reading a book while everybody else is coding, reviewing code, going to meetings, etc. Okay, so not only did it benefit my ability to perform at work, but I also felt better about myself learning more about parts of software engineering that I wasn't exposed to prior. All right. Two more things and then we'll wrap it up. The second to last thing I want to talk about is to not be afraid to ask for a steady stream of feedback. What do I mean by that? Well, when you go to your one-on-ones with your boss, and at the minimum you should have them once every month, you should ask your boss, what can I do better? What can I improve? He might genuinely tell you that, hey, listen, given your skill set and your position and your tenor, you're outperforming and just keep doing what you're doing. I, I like that you do X, Y, and Z. He might also tell you that, hey, uh, you should have done this better or that better. For example, I'd like you to take more initiative or um, I would like you to pay more attention to detail. I saw that this happened and you needed to improve because of blah, blah, blah. It took more time than it needed to. I don't know. Whatever, whatever your boss is going to tell you. And so it might feel uncomfortable to hear that, to hear that you need to improve because we're obviously very guarded about um, our, our skill sets and and some people especially at the junior level they do have a degree of imposter syndrome when they enter the job but nonetheless being told what you need to improve and hearing that internalizing it and working on it is only going to make you a better software engineer and quantitative developer in the long run okay guys and the last thing that i want to talk to you guys about is total compensation now obviously in this industry you're compensated very well and um, out of school at least starting six-figure salaries and and bonuses that can go up into the six figures and even beyond at some places um, and total compensation is important this point isn't saying ignore total compensation what this point is saying is that total compensation isn't everything this doesn't mean that you shouldn't strive to be paid the fair market rate for your skill set your tenor your years of experience but nonetheless money isn't everything now, this might be hard to hear for somebody that's currently, I guess, unemployed and looking for a job, but the crux of this point is this. If somebody came up to me and said, Coding Jesus, I want you to come to work in a suit every day and we're gonna pay you an extra $15,000 for doing so. I'm gonna say no, because my degree of comfort, being able to walk into work in flip-flops and pajamas, outweighs that additional $15,000 that's really not going to have an impact on the quality of my life. Yeah, maybe I'll retire with an extra, you know, if I invest that, it compounds, maybe I'll retire with an extra $100,000. But today, with that 15, extra $15,000, is it really going to make a difference as to how I live and where I see myself? No. Now, it might be a different story if somebody says, we'll pay you an extra $150,000 if you come to work in a clown outfit and full makeup. Maybe I'd accept that. Probably still not but maybe I would accept that. But nonetheless, I think you guys get my point. Make sure you're paid fairly, that's gonna be important, but you don't need to feel like you are at a loss or you're missing out 
if you aren't being paid the maximum possible for your position in this space. And guys, with that, I'm gonna end the video. If you guys would like to speak to me one-on-one, -on -one, I still do consulting, I still have people reaching out to me, and I, I'm still helping people land positions in the space, whether you're a quantitative developer, quantitative researcher, or quantitative trader. Um, in particular, quantitative developers, I offer mock technical and behavioral interviews. I also offer resume reviews for anybody in the space, and just in general, mentorship and coaching. I tell people kind of their one month, three month, six month career plan in the space, what they should be doing, the resources they should, they should be tapping into, and answer general questions. Uh, if you'd like to follow my life behind the scenes here in the Grand Cayman Islands, you can follow me at vcodingg.